Hey everybody, it's Ian O'Byrne again. I'm digging in a little bit more into my use of hypothesis in my classes. Um, this week I had a really cool question um, from my friend Sarah uh, and she asked basically what do I do in a class when I have a student that prefers to read on paper, annotate on paper? What is the thought process? Like what steps do I take if I expect students to use hypothesis? On one level, um, in the past in my classes, what I did was I gave students the option and I basically said, okay, you know, I want to use hypothesis. I want to try it out. This is a pilot test. This is a trial to see if this works or does not work in my classes. But the expectation is that you use it and you give it a good shot. I noticed that in the class, what I would also do is I would, um, I would hedge my bet a little bit by suggesting that if they wanted to, they could still print out and mark up and annotate. Um, and that caused more confusion than I wanted to. So this semester, now what I say is basically, you need to use hypothesis for all of your annotations. I want you to use this. There are reasons why. Um, I explain at the beginning one of the reasons why, but then throughout the course, I explain other reasons. And most of the reasons relate to, you know, my, in, my research uh, and, and teaching and learning with literacy and technology, but then also it relates to the content of some of the classes. So most of my classes are about language and literacy or technology, and I want the students to think about the way that texts are changing. So, you know, I try to problematize their thinking about writing, and that it doesn't have to be just print on paper or handwriting on paper, um, you know, that there are many ways to quote unquote write or create. Um, and so I'm always problematizing their thinking about text and problematizing their thinking about literacy um, and language. And I think my use of hypothesis is is a good way to, to problematize their thinking about reading. Um, and so I basically put everything on end. And so the, like the, the message is in the medium in a way or messages in the mode. Um, so on one level, what I've done this semester is I basically given a decree, I guess, that, you know, thou shalt use hypothesis for reading. That being said, I did have a student come by yesterday and said, look, I really can't get this done. The, the, the screen hurts my eyes. Um, and I, and I suggested, look, if you want to keep printing it out and then move over to hypothesis and add your annotations, you can. Um, but to me, that seems like busy work and I don't, that's not the point of this. Um, it, you know, what I did suggest is that, that she uh, check out different settings on the monitor and that there's different apps and extensions for Chrome or the Chrome browser that could make your browser or the text look different. Um, that could make it look like a Kindle or an e-reader or there's different ways to mess around with Chrome so that you can help adjust the, the color and scale and font and everything else. And that might be an option. Um, but for now, what I do is I, I basically require my students to use Hypothesis. This uh, initial question from Sarah led to a really nice longer discussion about how many of us use hypothesis. And one of the things that I said in the discussion is that I use hypothesis primarily to have a discussion with my students or have my students discuss with one another, um, have discussion about text baked into the text. And what that means, it could be different things for different places. So what I wanted to do is show you two examples of how I currently use hypothesis and how they are completely different. Um, and and j basically as a way to show you how I'm thinking about and using the tool, but then also opportunities for you to think about how you might use this tool. So one of the ways in which I use hypothesis is in my basic language and literacy classes. And this class is basically you come in, you're thinking about language and literacy and communication and socializing and, and cognitive development. And for the most part, in years past, what we would do is we would have one text that you would read across the semester or a number of PDFs. And so you would read and then you come in and you would, um, you know, you would either take quizzes or you take a midterm. Um, in this class, what I basically had them do is they, uh, I give them the PDFs for the, for the readings and I lay them out through the semester and each section is reading one PDF or two PDFs, basically one or two chapters together. So each week I give them one or two readings and they read it together in hypothesis 
um, and I basically create, as I talked about in another video, I create private groups for each section. So it, what ends up happening is, you know, the 20, 25 students in one section of this class will be in one document reading and annotating. Everybody's in one chapter, um, and then the other section is in one chapter together. Um, this is still pretty problematic. And the reason why it's problematic is, you know, if I have 20, 25 students all in the chapter reading and annotating together, it gets pretty messy pretty quickly. And one common complaint is that they're trying to read, but it's, it's annoying when they see all of the other markups and annotations and highlights already there. You know, if they show up, if they're the 10th person in, already it's overloaded. So one of the things I suggest is, you know, go in, um, you know, you, you can click the little view all, hide all button, the little eyeball in Hypothesis, and you can hide all the annotations, and you can just mark up and annotate cleanly. Um, another thing that I suggested is that what you might choose to do is, you might choose to, and, and this works different ways for different readers, you might choose to go in and read, and then see what other people are saying and, and the annotations they are making, and you reply to other readers, to other comments out there. Um, and so this is an interesting way to think about reading and the, the synthesis involved. Um, in, in essence, what I'm asking students to do is, you know, one level is think about the text and just mark up and annotate the text, um, you know, as the primary source in a way, but then the other way is looking at commentary about the text and the text and that middle ground in between and you respond to those comments and carry on dialogue about the text baked into the text. Um, so there's like two or three different ways of reading just in this use of hypothesis. But once again, you know, in this one class, you're all reading the same materials. You're reading the same materials. Um, I either launch the materials through, um, you know, a class wiki where I basically will upload the wiki and I'll say, okay, here is um, your you know, here is the chapter, the PDF, you can download it and run it yourself. Or if you want, I already preloaded this thing in Hypothesis, just make sure you are annotating in our group. Recently, I've been using a lot of Google Classroom, trying to raise, trying to scale up my use of it. Um, and so in Google Classroom, what I'll do is I'll say, okay, here is the chapter, I preloaded it in Hypothesis for you, mark it up and annotate it in our group. So they go into classroom, they go over to the document, um, and then they can mark up the text there. Um, and once again, I said there, there's positives and negatives for this. What I do as the, uh, uh, from an assessment point of view, is I'll come into the document after they have been marking up and annotating and writing. Um, and so this is one piece that they've already been in. And if I go into our group, I can see that there's already a number of annotations in here. Um, and so some students will come in and say it's a little bit annoying to see all of these markups and, and comments and stuff like that. So if you wanted to, I could come in here and respond to what a student is saying. Okay, so I could come in and, and click a response. And some students indicated that they preferred that. They preferred coming in and reading and then coming back and responding to the comments. Um, that's intriguing to me. Um, but, you know, the, the question is, how do I assess that? Um, you know, is, is one more worth more than the other? At this point, no. So I basically have a five-point rubric. And what I do for this class is I indicate to them that I will basically uh, go in to Hypothesis and I will go to our specific groups. You know, when I assess, I say, okay, I will um, every two weeks, three weeks, I will go in, I'll definitely go in in the midterm and the final, but I will, you know, irregular, irregularly go in and see what you're doing. Um, and so I can click on the document, see who's doing what and who's making annotations. And then I can also go in and click on your name specifically, and I can see, okay, what are you doing? When are you doing it? When are you, when are you adding this content? And what I can do is very quickly go in and assess their comments and assess their work and give uh, a very lightweight grade per week for um, their reading and participation. So that is one example of one class. Um, for the most part, very simple. It works well. 
Um, you know, if I were to change this, what I might do is I might have two or three private groups per class marking up and annotating. A student suggested when I asked them, you know, pedagogically, what would they do? How, what differences or what changes would they make? One student suggested that perhaps individual groups could use a hashtag. So it could have like EDEE3251, EDEE3252. And so smaller groups could use a hashtag and that would be a way for me and them to keep things separate. I think that's kind of smart. Um, but for the most part, the use of hypothesis in this one group is pretty simple. You are reading these texts in class. You are reading and responding and annotating and marking up. I'm checking in to make sure that you're paying attention and you're having, you're engaging in dialogue or discussion about the text baked into the text as evidence or as assessed by my rubric, which I've shown before, but I'll scroll through here. Um, so I'm looking through to see if you're having discussions. For the most part, it works. I do have, con I do have um, some pushback from students that suggest that they would much rather print it out and mark it up and annotate it. I'm still trying to figure out how I feel about that. Um, but for the most part, things work. Um, and, and it's just seeing how they follow through and how they make those connections. And then I go through every, you know, uh, irregularly with the rubric to see what are they doing? Are they paying attention? Are they prepared for class? But then also I, I, I find evidence of the readings in other assessments in the class. So this is not the only time I check in on the readings. It's very important. Um, the materials and the ideas um, are pulled in through different threads and different assessments across the class. That's something very important to note. Um, but for the most part, it works. I might change the groupings a little bit, um, but you know, it, it's pretty standard. For a different class, um, this is an example of my project-based learning class. I use hypothesis as well, but the, the structure is completely different. Um, and so in this class, what we do is in, they still use hypothesis for the readings and, and marking up and annotating the readings over time, but they're not marking up and annotating and reading the same things. What they're doing is they're basically using hypothesis as a way to leave little digital breadcrumbs behind for my, my use, my assessment, but also for, for their use um, as they read, as they synthesize, as they write, as they construct. Um, and I'll show you what this looks like. So in this class, what I do is right now, this class lives in our uh, learning management system. Uh, we call it Oaks. It's a desire to learn piece. But basically what I have set up in here is uh, the, the course is organized into four modules. Um, so I have four modules set up. Each module basically takes two weeks. So I have two or three weeks at the beginning of the year, two uh, at the beginning of the semester, two or three weeks at the end of the semester. And then in the middle of the semester, I have uh, four modules. Each module takes two weeks. And so there is a cadence that I set up, like a TikTok of knowing what you have to do and when you have to do it. So for each module, what I set up, and I'll do videos later on this structure, I have set up a, you know, module one and the, the overview of module one, um, which is my learning outcomes and the video and stuff like that, uh, uh, you know, a digging deeper video. And then I have a read, watch, discuss, do section. Um, so I have four modules and then within each module I have read, watch, discuss, do. This is, it happens all the time. So if I go into um, the do section first, the do section, so for module one, their assessments are, um, number one, do a little bit of work on your website, continue to build this up. You know, this will be the, the beginning of the course. Um, I also want them to think about a unit plan they're constructing for class and give me an update, answer the prompts in the discussion. Um, but then what I also want them to do is for module one, I want them to read, synthesize, search for other texts and synthesize what they learned and reflect on what they learned in module one. So in this two week block of content, tell me what you learned. Okay. Um, I should also state for this class and with many of my classes, um, I prefer not to give them a specific prompt. I don't want to say answer this and tell me what you learned. My suggestion is that, you know, 
I steer you in a direction by showing you different texts and different pieces of information. I want to see what you pick out of this. I want to see what you pick out of this from your, your, you know, uh, epistemological uh, beliefs. I want you to think about uh, pedagogy, about your content area, about your grade level, but I want you to tell me what the question is or what the prompt is. I want you to reflect um, and not just sort of check off a box as to what I think you should glean from this content. So the one of the major assignments for each module is to reflect in a blog post. And so this is where it gets fun. So if I go into reading, what I say is, okay, I give you for module one in the reading section, I give you five links. I give you five websites, five PDFs, um, and, I, and I suggest that this, this series of five links is not exhaustive. And what I mean by that is read one, read all, read none. But if you look through this, you can see that I am focusing on module one, project-based learning, web literacies, and then understanding by design and backward design. So those are the directions that we're heading as we work our way through module one. So you can make several hypotheses about what I'm doing or where I'm heading in this first module. Um, and so what I suggest to students is click through, read them all, mark them up and annotate in hypothesis if you so choose. Um, or you might decide that you don't want to follow my links. You might say, I don't trust anything that this person has told me. What I want to do is open up a new tab and I'm going to search for, you know, project based learning and I'm just going to go out my own, or I'm going to go to uh, Google Scholar, and I'm just going to go into Google Scholar on my own. I trust my own online search habits. I'm going to go into Google Scholar and search for project-based learning, and I'm just going to make it, um, I'm going to figure it out on my own. Uh, and that's absolutely appropriate. So if you go into Google Scholar and you find your own resources, that's fine. Regardless of the decision that you make, you are too mark up and annotate and use hypothesis and leave a trail of breadcrumbs to show me where you have been. Okay. Show me where you've been, include a, a hashtag for our class so I can follow and also your peers can follow you. So if we have 15, 20 people in a class, I might choose certain links and areas for project-based learning and my peers might choose others. I might be able to follow their learning pathway off in that direction. So they are basically set free to go search online and figure out and learn and, and understand what these concepts are and synthesize and draw all of these threads together. The reason for this is one element of online reading comprehension is searching and sifting and synthesizing text. Another, you know, another way to state that is that you have to know what's important and when you've learned enough and when you've answered the question, you have to figure out how do I answer the question and then what parts do I ignore? So I'm, I'm giving them information and giving them a path to follow, but I'm also including some distractor information here. So I'm, I'm basically embedding online reading comprehension or those philosophies into the assignment, into the assessment, into the ways in which they learn. So they use hypothesis almost as like a tether to show me where they've been. And I suggest to them that, yes, every once in a while in the semester, I will go back and I will look at, you know, your hypothesis links and see where you have been. But more importantly, the reason why hypothesis is important is when you write that blog post, when you write the blog post, what I want you to do is go in and, and I've, as I've shown them in class, what I think is fundamentally cool, and let's see if it works here for me. What's cool is I can take a specific link. I don't know if this will work for me. And I can use this as a citation in a blog post. So if I paste that, or if I have that as a link in my synthesis, I can write up a blog post that will have a link. When I click on the link, it will bring me to the page. Yeah, it's a private, a private group, so it won't show it. But if this were public, that link would open up into a new blog post and bring me exactly to where um, I need to be exactly to the citation that I'm trying to use. Um, and so as they're reading, as they're marking up stuff in Hypothesis, they can keep track of where they've been. And then when they sit down at the end of the week and they write up this synthesis as they pull this together in a, in a blog post or other, you know, whatever response you have, they can look back through their, their breadcrumbs in Hypothesis and say, okay, I went to 15 different websites, read 10 different pieces, um, and I learned this about, about project-based learning, 
Um, I don't really care about the understanding by design or web literacy right now. I'm really interested in project-based learning. Show me where you've been, explain what it means, tell me what your thoughts are, synthesize, reflect, and pull in those um, the, the, the source information using hypothesis. So now, instead of the other class where everyone's reading one text, this class, anyone can read pretty much anything. And you decide and you sculpt that narrative and you tell me what you've read. Um, and so while we're here, um, I'll talk about one of the pet peeves I have, not one of the pet peeves, but one of the directions I would like to see hypothesis go. Um, so as, so each section is, you know, each module has read, watch, discuss, do. The read has five reading links. Under watch, I have five uh, videos. So these are five videos all on YouTube. Um, I link out to them so they can, you know, and they connect with the readings as well. So you can see I have, you know, three, three about project-based learning, one about web literacy, and one about understanding by design. So they tie in nicely with the readings. And my suggestion is, look, go into the reading section, read those materials, go into the watch section, watch the videos that I have there. The challenge is what I would love to have is I love to be able to basically do what I do with hypothesis in the YouTube videos. I love to have the students watching a YouTube video and stop and sort of mark a time point and leave a comment and then share that link out from that time point. There are other tools that can do this. Um, you know, one tool that I have used in the past is uh, Video Ant. So Video Ant is an open source uh, tool that will basically allow me to mark up and annotate and leave questions. Um, but then another one is Vialogs. And what I would love to see happen, um, and these two tools basically do with video what you see with Hypothesis. But my dream would be that I could have uh, a student read and basically look across these different texts, look across video and text and other images and other materials and basically mark up and annotate any text and leave notes on any text. And then at the end of a period of time, come back and, synth and synthesize. So once again, what I'm looking at is two versions of how I use hypothesis, um, two completely different ways that I have students uh, process information. One of which is uh, if I have a class where all students are reading the same chapter or two, I have them all mark up and annotate in hypothesis. The the challenges in this, uh, basically, if they some of the challenges are if they're not used to hypothesis, which most of my students are not, um, that's a challenge. If they are used to reading a different way, that is also a challenge. One of the challenges in this use of hypothesis is um, if you have a lot of students all reading and annotating at the same time, the text can be um, have a lot of highlights and markups, and that's distracting to a lot of students. Um, there's different ways to get around that, but it still is an issue. Um, and then the last challenge is, you know, is there a difference between a student marking up and annotating the text, um, just looking solely at the text, as opposed to a student that is looking at the text and looking at the comments and responding to comments and adding their own commentary as well is one form of reading and synthesis and cognition uh, much more rigorous or deeper than the other. I don't know yet. Um, I'm still thinking through that, but for right now, that's one of the things that I'm noticing. Another way that I currently use hypothesis is um, I, I used to use Storify in the past, and now I use hypothesis for this, uh, for this purpose. And what I basically do is give my students a, a topic. I don't give them a prompt, but I give them a topic or a focus, or I sort of narrow in on a focus, um, uh, on a topic. And I basically say, you are to research in this area. You are to research in project-based learning. You are to research in semantic information. Uh, you are to research in um, blockchain technologies. You know, So this week or this module or this semester, this is our area of focus. Go forth, <laughs> go forth, search, sift, synthesize, you go find out what you learned. This is all inquiry-based learning. You go figure out what you learned. Come back in, and we'll reflect on some of the challenges that you've had along the way, um, but you go forth, learn, 
bring it back in, use Hypothesis to keep track of where you've been, uh, and then synthesize it in some form of output. The challenges in this, once again, the student might not be used to Hypothesis. Many of them are not. Um, they might not be used to. One of the bigger challenges that, that you sometimes deal with is students are not used to this sort of work. They're not used to just the open-ended, inquiry-based, student interest uh, student interest driven nature of the work they're used to you know okay answer this question give me this answer move on they're not used to go learn and go be free and explore um, and and it's you know and and using a networked medium as the teaching tool um, they don't know what to do with that many students um, they don't know okay have I answered the question um, and I'm like well that's part of the, that's part of the assessment as well um, you have to decide when you've learned enough um, and, and you understand and you, you fully, um, you know, comprehend the content. So there, there's different challenges and different purposes with this. One of the, the last things I'll state is what's interesting is I have um, some students that are in both of these classes. And so they what's interesting is they're in my language and literacy class. They're also in my technology or project based learning class. And what's interesting is that they see my use of hypothesis across those two spaces. And what I frequently do is at the end of the semester, I'll talk with them about um, differences that they see across those two spaces um, and, and what choices I'm making. And I'll report back on that at the end. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed this. Um, I dug in a little bit deeper than I had planned to, um, but I think it was important to, um, you know, crystallize or make granular some of my thinking about this up to this point um, because there's a lot of moving parts and in a way it was sort of fun for me to take a little bit of time and figure this out so sarah i appreciate it thanks for the question thanks for the prompt um and i will i don't know what the answer is i'm still trying to figure it out um but with that we're going to shut it down because we're at 26 minutes so have a great day subscribe to the channel if you haven't Give me a comment um, or a thumbs up or a like if you want to. Um, by all means, have a great rest of the day.